This is a 67-year-old female with Disney and neck surgeon, New York Heart Association Class 3, with multiple medical problems, including Hodgkin's lymphoma treated with radiation, partial nephrectomy, now with chronic kidney disease, DVT and pulmonary embolism on chronic anticoagulation, radiation-induced multivalvular disease with prior aortic valve replacement in 2009 with a 21 millimeter Hancock 2 valve, severe COPD on home oxygen, and single vessel coronary artery disease with 60% mid-LED stenosis. Her STS a predicted risk of mortality for reoperation for mitral valve replacement was 6%, and for mitral valve replacement and coronary artery bypass was 15%. She was considered to have extreme surgical risk due to the multiple comorbidities, but also due to the massive mitral annual calcification and was referred for transcatheter mitral valve replacement. The baseline echocardiogram showed preserved ejection fraction in normal function of the aortic prosthesis, as well as severe mitral stenosis with a mean green of 11 millimeters of mercury in a mitral valve area between 1.2 and 1.3 centimeters squared. This is the 3D transesophageal echocardiogram images that show severe extensive mitral annular calcification with calcium involving already the leaflets causing restriction of the movement. There's also moderate mitral regurgitation, but the primary pathology here is mitral stenosis. We obtain a cardiac CT scan as it is our usual practice when evaluating these patients. This is a trimensio analysis of the mitral annular area. Uh, we obtain these measurements in diastole. As you can see, the cardiac phase is 85%. And we got an area of 680 millimeters squared, which is on the upper limits of a 29 millimeter sapient three valve. The septolateral diameter is 26, and the intercommissural diameter was 34, which would indicate that this patient uh, would have high risk of paravalvular leak. This is a different view that shows the amount and distribution of calcium. We can see that uh, there is more calcium in the posterior portion of the annulus, and the trigons are partially calcified, but uh, with the presence of a prosthetic valve in aortic position, we thought that the structures would be enough to provide enough anterior anchoring uh, for a balloon expandable aortic transcatheter heart valve. Now, these measurements are done in systole. We, you can see the cardiac phase is 40%. Uh, we measure the aortomitral angle, and in this case, is borderline at almost 120. The other thing that we can uh, appreciate here is that the septum is very thick and the LV cavity is small. So these two features would uh, put patients at risk uh, for LVOT obstruction. And these two features are often present when patients have aortic um, valvular disease, which is uh, the case uh, in this patient. We then place a virtual valve um, illustrated here in pink. This is a 29 millimeter sapient 3 valve in systole. And we noted here that there is a very decreased space at the level of the LVOT. So essentially, the transcatheter valve occupies most of the space. In a different view, we can appreciate the same. This is the LVOT, and the virtual valve occupies most of the space. The septum is thick. So the next step is to measure the neo-LVOT area. So in order to do that, we are going to obtain measurements in the cross-sectional view of the LVOT at this level, uh, where the transcatheter valve is in closest proximity um, to the septum. We measure the LVOT space, in this case was 351 millimeters squared, the area. This is a septum, very thick. We then place the virtual valve and measure the remaining space. So the virtual valve is illustrated in pink. And then we measure the remaining space in the LVOT, which in this case was 138 millimeters square, which is considered small. And this will put the patient at high risk for LVOT obstruction. A neo LVOT area of more than 250 millimeters square uh, would have low risk of LVOT obstruction. We know that less than 190 millimeters square would be high risk and anywhere in between would 
still be a gray zone. But this is clearly high risk for LVOT obstruction. For that reason, we decided to do something to decrease her risk. And with the septal thickness, we thought that the next uh, most appropriate step would be to proceed with septal reduction therapy. She was a good candidate because she had a good septal target. We usually aim uh, for the septal branch that is uh, closest to the base. We wired this branch. Uh, this is a 1.5 millimeter balloon. And um, we confirm with echo contrast that the branch is supplying blood flow to the area of interest. Once you confirm, uh, you can inject the alcohol, which in this case, one milliliter of 98% dehydrated alcohol was injected over five minutes. And uh, the final angiogram shows that the septal branch is no longer uh, present. We then obtained a follow-up cardiac CT scan three weeks after alcohol septal ablation. Uh, we can notice here that the septal thickness has decreased and the space in the LVOT has increased. This is the same virtual valve and now we have more space at the level of the LVOT. These are the new measurements. The LVOT area was 410, which increased from 350, and the neo-LVOT now is 217, so uh, significant improvement compared with 137. So therefore, we decided as a team that it was safe to proceed with transeptal transcatheter mitral valve replacement using a 29 millimeter sapin 3 valve. We do our pre-procedural planning based on CT analysis. We determine the deployment angle. We want to place this valve, the mitral valve, uh, completely coplanar. In this case, the deployment angle was RAO 50 degrees. We then place the virtual valve, usually 80% in the left ventricle, 20% in the atrium, to decrease the risk of embolization to the left atrium. In this case, because of concern of LVOT obstruction, because the space is still small here, as you can see, uh, we place the virtual valve more in the range of 60% ventricular, 40% atrial. Once we have the valve um, in position, we look for a fluoroscopic radiopaque marker that you can use to determine your landing zone. And in MAC cases, it's usually a piece of calcium. So you find a piece of calcium that you don't want to go more ventricular than that to help you determine your landing zone. We have to keep in mind that when we deploy these valves, everything else is going to move. The atrial edge is going to foreshorten, and the center marker is going to move as well. Therefore, the only thing that does not move during deployment is the ventricular edge. If you have a landing zone, then we should just keep our attention to the landing zone uh, during deployment. Then we remove the virtual valve, and this is what we're going to see under fluoro, and this is what we are going to keep in mind when placing the valve in position. We then use our uh, CT scan also to help us plan the transeptal axis. Uh, we aim for an inferior and posterior entry because uh, being superior makes the uh, manipulation of the equipment more difficult. It's a lot easier to navigate if you are inferior and posterior. And we do measure this both in AP as well as in RAO. Uh, in this case, I mean, the deployment angle was RAO 50, and we measure the distance from the entry point um, in the uh, mitral annulus. Usually 25 to 35 millimeters is enough. When we place the patient on the table for the procedure, one of the first things we do is confirm our deployment angle and fluoroscopy. And uh, these deployment angles are often um, extreme angles, like either extreme RAO or RAO caudal. And sometimes we need to move the arms uh, to the head, and there may be other uh, equipment that you need to get out of the way in order to improve your visibility. So it's important to do that before we start the procedure. Once we do that, we uh, also pay attention to our landing zone, the fluoroscopic marker, just to confirm that we can see it. We do these procedures under transesophageal echocardiogram. We confirm that there is no uh, thrombus in the left atrial appendage. We can see here the heavy calcification of the mitral annulus. The mean gradient was 8 um, under G3 
general anesthesia. We then obtain access. We start with a six French in the left femoral artery. Uh, we prefer long sheaths and ideally bright tip if possible. The reason for a long sheath is to allow simultaneous measurement of the left ventricular pressure to a five French pigtail through the sheath and the aortic pressure through the side arm of the six French. Uh, we do the simultaneous measurement to be able to detect any changes in the LVOT gradients during deployment. We then obtain access in the left femoral vein. It's also useful to use a long sheath in the vein. The reason is um, this will help you manipulate the pacemaker position because sometimes when you have the large sheath in the IVC, it may uh, compromise your ability to reposition the pacemaker. So a long seven French sheath in the left femoral vein may be helpful. We then obtain right femoral venous access pre-close with two pro sutures, one or two, and we then introduce the Edwards sheath. Um, in general, using a 16 French for all valve sizes may be adequate. You know, the difference between 14 and 16 in a vein in terms of risk of bleed is minimal, and it just facilitates uh, introducing the, the valve. So we just use 16 for all sizes. We then perform transeptal puncture under transesophageal echocardiogram guidance and place a deflectable sheath in the left atrium. What you see here is an agilis sheath, which will help us uh, facilitate navigating across the mitral valve with a pictal catheter. Uh, we prefer to cross with a pictal and not with a wire because the wire can get through cordae, and um, the risk of that is decreased uh, if you cross with a pictal. Once the pictal catheter is at the apex, uh, we introduce our pre-shaped wire, which can be an extra small safari or any other pre-shaped wire. Once the wire is in proper position, we uh, perform atrial septostomy, and we like to floss the trajectory with the balloon partially inflated uh, to make sure that the wire is not trapped to cordae or any other uh, components of the subalveolar apparatus. Once we confirm it's free, then we are ready to uh, place the transcatheter valve. It's important to mention that the preparation of this valve is going to be different than it is for TAVR. The ceiling skirt of the valve needs to be on the atrial side. Therefore, mounting this valve will be in the opposite direction as you normally do for transfemoral TAVR. Once, uh, the orientation is confirmed. We crimp the valve and get it ready. The valve is introduced uh, in the IVC with the Edwards logo facing up, just like you normally do for TAVR. We then align the valve, and once the valve is aligned, it may be helpful to rotate the equipment 180 degrees over its own axis to be able to flex towards the mitral valve, which will be in the opposite direction than what you normally do for transfemoral TAVR. So if you observe the Edwards logo up, you'll notice in the next pictures how we do this. We just start rotating over its own axis. And now Edwards logo is facing down. So now we're ready to navigate the anatomy and position the valve across the mitral valve. This is usually achieved in one single slow movement. It requires two or three operators. As one operator is introducing the equipment, the other operator is controlling the wire. We need tension on this wire to help us facilitate nav navigating over this wire. Another operator ad adds flex to the system as much as needed. Every patient is different, but usually you can do this in just one single uh, movement. This particular valve was prepared with five additional uh, cc's of contrast. We usually add at least four or five for the 29 millimeter valve. Once we are across the valve, we pull the pusher back to the most distal of the three radiopaque markers. Pulling any more distal than that doesn't help because the pusher may end up in the right atrium, which would not be helpful, and uh, you would lose support. Um, and the operators may need pushability during deployment, and you may lose that ability if you pull back too far. So we just recommend to leave the pusher there. 
The other thing we do in this view is we pay attention to our radio peak uh, marker that uh, we had decided would be our landing zone. And we're trying to aim to place the ventricular edge of the stent valve at the level of the uh, landing zone. Once we do that, we're ready to deploy, which is done in a slow deployment under rapid pacing, holding ventilation very slow to allow this operator to adjust the position. You'll see that the operator pushes to achieve a more coaxial horizontal position during deployment, and our stand frame was at the uh, level of the landing zone that we had predetermined based on CT. After deployment, we evaluate the function of the valve with the transesophageal echocardiogram. And what we see here is moderate to severe paravalvular leak, which was expected based on the cardiac CT analysis. We were prepared to do paravalvular leak closure, which was attempted. We were able to cross with the wire, but the catheters were not able to cross the small space. Therefore, we decided to proceed with farther balloon post dilatation uh, to decrease the amount of paravalvular leak. During the initial deployment, with five, we had five additional milliliters of contrast. We added three more, so we post dilated with a total of eight additional cc's of contrast. The TE showed that the paravalvular leak improved, but it was still at least moderate. Therefore, we decided to do one more post dilatation, adding two more milliliters of contrast for a total of 10. This is the maximum amount that we have used in several cases already, but we have not gone any more than 10. And we reevaluated the function. Uh, we see that there is just trace central MR. Um, usually 10 uh, cc's of additional contrast do not cause any more than trace MR, but with trace central MR, we decided to not add any more volume. In addition to that, the paravalvular leak uh, amount had already decreased. Therefore, we decided to stop at this point and reevaluate the patient later on. The patient did well. Uh, the next day, um, the echo showed only trace central MR and trace uh, paravalvular leak. The mean mitral gradient was 2.3. The mitral valvular was 2.6. And more importantly, the LVOT gradient was only 2.9. Uh, during deployment, that was monitored as well uh, with the simultaneous pressures obtained from the pictal and the sheath, and there was no LVOT gradient. In a 30 days, she is stable at home uh, with improved symptoms now. In YHA class 1, the echocardiogram at 30 days shows just mild paravalvular leak. And the mean mitral gradient was 5 millimeters of mercury. The mean LVOT gradient was 2 millimeters of mercury. So a very satisfactory result. We would like to emphasize that this procedure remains off-label, and it should be only reserved for patients who are severely symptomatic from severe valvular dysfunction with severe mitral annual calcification with limited treatment options due to extreme high surgical risk.